Oh, that'll be over. It might be in this room because I think we have power. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's in conference room C. And across from HR. Okay. The first bigger conference room across from HR. Is that the one we have our uh, health and human services in? Uh, way before that. So way it's before that. Literally okay. almost right in front of the room. Just down a couple doors on the left. On the left hand side. Okay. All right. All right. Yep. Gina ain't here, she ain't gonna sing. You could sing, you know. It's 1.30. I'd like to call to order the Board of Commissioners meeting. The date is September 22nd. And our invocation today is by Commissioner Terpstra, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. <laughs> Lord, thank you for all the things you've been provided us today. Please provide us with the wisdom over the decisions we make during this meeting. May you be with the farmers and their crops and bless them during this during the harvest. Lord, I pray for our service men and women home and abroad that you protect them as they protect us. And uh, just be with us today and bless us and amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Roebuck, would you call a roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Garcia. Here. Mr. Bauman. Here. Mr. Zylstra. Here. Mr. Dannenberg. Here. Mr. Meppelink. Here. Mr. Turfstra. Here. Mr. Holtvor. Present. Mr. DeYoung. Here. Mr. Kyers. Mr. Bergman. Here. And Mr. Fenske. Here. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Presentations of petitions and communications? Uh, none from us. Okay. Public comment. This is the <coughs> first time in our meeting that uh, anyone can address the commission. With any public comments, we ask that you limit your time to three minutes. Give us your name and address. Would anyone like to address the commission at this time? If not, is there anyone on Zoom? We do have a one comment from a Ruth Van Hoven. Okay. And so Ruth, we're just gonna ask you to state your name us for the record. And we need her name and address. Is that what you said? Yes and limit your time to three minutes. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Ruth Van Hoven. My address is 8276 Hayes Street in Coopersville, Michigan. I am a new precinct delegate in Polkton Township. And uh, I've always voted and have never been involved in politics. And uh, I've been three months into this and I found that there's a lot of people in Ottawa County that are silent, that have a lot to say, and I've been talking with them. And so I have two um, areas to comment on today. One is on the extension of the uh, state of emergency. And I've been seeing a lot of comments this morning in the Ottawa County groups on Facebook to be able to be a voice for at least about 30 people saying, 
no, we need to put an end to the state of emergency. We need to allow small businesses to open up. We need to have people have their freedom back. And we need to be able to um, deal with this in a state that is uh, without the censorship that we're receiving blasted at us. Uh, to be able to look at all the facts, and even though many of them are censored, to be able to take a look at that. Um, I have a comment here from a local ER doc, and his comment is, his name is Dr. Eric Severson. As an ER physician, I can tell you both anecdotally and factually based on CDC data that although there have been more positive tests, there have been significantly less visits to ER, less hospitalizations, and a large decline in mortality from COVID. The measure would keep county offices closed, which adversely affects the economy. Not being able to meet with the register of deeds is harmful. And so I appreciate your ear, and I would hope that you would allow the citizens of Ottawa County to go back to their lives. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Anyone else? No one on Zoom, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, I do have one. We have another com, um, comment from Jerry. And again, Jerry, if you would just state your name, full name and address for the record. Can I, I un, is it unmuted? Can you hear me? We can. I can hear you. Okay, all right. I want to comment on a couple of things on the agenda. Uh, the first thing is I want to, whatever Ruth commented on, I totally agree with that. This is Jerry McCaleb, I'm sorry, 1235 Slayton, Grand Haven. Hi, Roger. Hi, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> I just, I, I would like to know what's the criteria for extending the state of emergency because as Ruth was saying uh, that cases, you know, that cases don't, just because you have a positive case doesn't mean you have a sick person. So if you just want to count cases, that doesn't, that doesn't say that there is a ton of sick people out there. There's a variety of reasons why people test positive. And if that's the criteria that's being used, I think that that one's kind of overblown. We started this months ago to flatten the curve. And uh, I think the curve is pretty flat. So to keep extending the state of emergency and hurting people and their businesses and their livelihoods is not a good thing for our county. And then the next item on your agenda is a is a a, uh, mm -hmm. a report from the Compensation Commission saying that you all should get a raise. Now I don't have a problem with some people getting a raise, but there is uh, I'm not sure what the criteria is or the, the you know the the justification for for everybody getting a raise. Because the people of the of the county aren't not everybody is getting a raise. A lot of people can't even open their businesses. So for people that are being paid by taxpayers rather than in the by the 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 work of their hand, is uh, I think that everybody ought to be on the same page. And if you, by extending this, if you do extend this state of emergency and you continue to hurt people's ability to make a living, then and to but at the same time give yourselves a pay raise is is not really fair to the people that you're supposed to be representing. So those are my comments and uh, y'all have a good meeting. Gary, anyone else? We do have one additional comment. Okay. Uh, Sandy, uh, Sandy B. And Sandy, again, if you could just state your full name and, and address for the record. Sure thing. This is Sandy Benton. Hi, guys. Um, my address is 2805 Judson Road, Spring Lake. I also am writing on the res, or not writing, I'm actually talking to you guys today regarding the resolution. Um, I'm questioning why we would want to give our administrator more authority for an emergency crisis that doesn't seem to exist. As the other stated right now, the crisis is almost all but gone. The numbers did increase. Um, the cases did increase, possibly because of the students who went back to college that were required to take a test. Um, but we do not have a health crisis right now for COVID in Ottawa County. The numbers don't support this resolution. 
So I'm just asking that you guys do your part uh, to work to open Ottawa County up rather than affect morale by keeping a non-existent emergency sort of present in our lives. If, if something changes and this so-called crisis gets worse, then have an emergency meeting to, to give the administrator those additional powers. But for now, I would request that you guys let this um, emergency extension just pass on it. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? No, sir. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Al, I, I think um, uh, when we come up with this um, part on the agenda regarding the um, <clears throat> extension of the emergency, I'll ask you to comment on it then. And, and sure. I can comment, Doug can comment as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And then you can say, you know, what it does and doesn't do. Sure. Because obviously there are some misunderstandings to what it really does. Yes. Okay, um, the next thing on our agenda is communication from county staff. And do we have Lisa on? I am I'm not seeing Lisa on. See her on either. I think she was planning to join uh, via Zoom. Hmm. You can okay. try to reach out or to her. She was going to be a, not a panelist, but an attendee. She's coming in right now. She's coming in now. She's coming in now. Okay. Okay. So we're going to wait for just a minute. Yes. She's coming in. Okay. Yes. All right. Pardon? Coming in via Zoom. All right. Oh. It's bouncing. Bouncing. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can, Lisa. Oh, good. I was having a hard time. I'm going. Wait, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Thanks, Lisa. About that. Yeah. Thank you for being patient and inviting me to the meeting today. Um, Marsha Mansory, our deputy director, is also here, um, just in case you have um, some in-depth uh, data type questions that need to be um, revealed. So as of 10 a.m. this morning, we've had a 3,269 total cases of COVID in Ottawa County. Um, we've had 66 total deaths which is a case fatality rate of 2%. Um, and if you wanna compare that to the state, the state of Michigan had a case fatality rate of 5.4% uh, and 3% in the United States overall. Um, we've had 140 total hospitalizations with a hospitalization rate of 4.3%. The Michigan Safe Start indicators has Ottawa County at a very high risk level for transmission with close to 80 new cases daily per million, um, which is a, a criteria the state uses in their determination of high, medium, and low risk. Despite the elevated case counts, we are beginning to see some evidence of slower transmission than we had just two weeks ago, which is very good news, um, when we had about 200 cases daily per million. Um, although it's been over 27 weeks since our first case in Ottawa was reported, um, up to 40% of all cases were only reported within the last four weeks. So um, this is the highest period of COVID transmission that we've seen since the very beginning of the pandemic in Ottawa County. Um, most of those cases um, have been associated with an ongoing outbreak of COVID-19 among Grand Valley State University students. Um, last week, um, as you all know, we did issue a staying in place order to GVSU students um, that live on campus and around the Allendale campus. Um, we've been working very, very closely with the leadership of Grand Valley State University. We've also been working with um, local leaders and um, including our own Ottawa County Sheriff's Office. Um, to make sure that we're really addressing all the, the concerns with regard to gathering in large groups that we're seeing on and around the campus. Um, some of the goals of the stay in place order um, include uh, preventing further spread beyond the current scope. Uh, we want to slow the transmission among this younger population um, and foster cooperation between the students and our um, efforts to do case and contact investigation. 
Um, moving forward, we are having daily briefings between um, our department and GVSU leadership um, and working closely to monitor the situation in hopes that just taking this two week period, we call it an incubation period, um, to try to slow down the spread on campus in hopes that it doesn't spread off campus to a more vulnerable or more um, high risk population. Test positivity continues to be an important metric that we're watching closely. Uh, with the recent surge in cases, overall test positivity increased slightly from close to 2% at the end of August to about 3%, which is our current rate of positivity. 3% um, puts us into the medium risk category. Daily test counts have also increased to about 1,000 tests per day. Hospitals in the county are also reporting adequate capacity at this time. Um, we haven't been seeing um, an increased surge in hospitalizations or fatalities or deaths related to this current outbreak, which is really good news. Um, the reason behind that, of course, is that we know that in the younger population, um, the severity of COVID-19 isn't um, quite what we see in the older adult population or the populations that have underlying health conditions, um, which is what we're trying to prevent the spread to. Um, we're also, just to let you know, we're facilitating free community testing clinics for anyone who is ill or might have been exposed and would just like to be tested. Um, we're trying to spread those throughout the county. Um, we've, we've been working with some of our, our fire departments so that they can drive right through the fire buildings, which has been really, really convenient. We've also partnered in some cases with schools who have allowed us to use their parking lot. Um, again, um, completely isolating any um, contact with students or faculty when we've done that. Um, and some other church organizations have partnered with us to, to do testing on their um, site as well. Finally, um, we're continuously calling on the general public, um, especially our young adults in particular who make up the bulk of new cases, to continue to uh, pay attention and play their part to uh, mitigate the outbreak um, by social distancing um, and really avoiding gathering altogether, staying away from others when they're sick, uh, maintaining at least a six foot difference, distance excuse me, from others, masking and frequently washing hands. Um, these are uh, still remain the best defense against COVID-19. Does anyone have any questions? Roger. Yes. Uh, Lisa, Joe Bauman. Um, actually, I have three questions for you. Okay. In the 66 um, reported deaths, are those including the probable deaths? I noticed on your um, information online, you have deaths, but then you have probable deaths. Right. Um, I believe, hang up, uh, if you can hang on just a quick second, uh, we're going to pull up our dashboard and then we'll be able to tell you whether or not those include probable. So, but I appreciate that question because we do want to be uh, very clear about that. So what have you got, Marcia? Yeah, um, neither. I know that we did have somebody early. Uh huh. Um, when we weren't able to get a test. I I apologize. I can't answer that question for you right now. Um, it's not showing up on my dashboard, and I'm not sure why. But I will get you that information um, immediately upon um, getting off the the call. The other questions I have, if we take the outbreak uh, at GBSU out of the numbers, mm -hmm. are we declining our numbers in the rest of the county? Are we, you know, is the rest of the county increasing as well? Um, and then the other question regarding GBSU is how are you enforcing the stay at place? Um, let me take the how are we enforcing this day in place and then I'm going to defer to Marsha to provide you with some um, comparative data with Grand Valley versus the rest of the county population. So um, I will say that 
the stay home order is a challenge to enforce. Um, but in working closely with Grand Valley and our, our uh, uh, Ottawa County Sheriff's Office, as well as the public safety um, on campus, I think we're doing a really good job of taking a reasonable approach to enforcement. Um, this isn't really about policing every single person every single minute. Um, what we're really trying to do is just slow the spread of COVID in that population. And so um, Grand Valley has put in place some, um, I guess, consequences for failure to comply with the student code of conduct and following the order that we've put in place as part of that student code of conduct. Um, our, our law enforcement has been monitoring weekend parties and gatherings and have been um, intervening in those situations to kind of break things up. Um, we do have the ability to issue citations, um, you know, fines. Um, we haven't had to do that yet, um, fortunately, and we, we've been really trying to, um, again, take a reasonable approach and educate these young people about the importance and helping them to get back to what they came to Grand Valley State University for, which is to get a a world-class education and to be able to have a full experience of a university education and that's that's really what we want for them um, and so we're taking a, a strong educational approach and we've seen we've already seen the numbers are starting to drop down a little bit um, we do feel that the vast majority of students are very compliant um, with the order um, they want this to be over as much as anybody and so they're really willing to um, hunker down, so to speak, for this two-week period so that they can get back to um, their experience as a student. Hello, commissioners. Um, this is Marcia Mantere. So as far as the question about what are we seeing with uh, the people that reside in the community that aren't Grand Valley students. So as Lisa said, we're in our third wave of cases, which is the biggest wave we've had yet. And that started with Grand Valley students. And what I'm seeing is about halfway through this wave, we're starting to see an increase of non-GVSU affiliated cases. Um, it is not escalating rapidly, but it is going up slightly from where we were at the end, middle to end of August. So, and I would have to look into that more deeply to see what um, zip codes are more affected if there are. I did look at 49401 and it is not due to non-student residents of 49401, which is the Allendale area zip code. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And Lisa, you're going to get back with us uh, to, for the answer uh, to um, Joe's first question. I will. It's um, related to probable versus confirmed um, with our, our death rate. And I will, um, if it's okay, I can actually text it to Al if he would like to give you that information before the end of the meeting, or I can just email it to you later. Yeah, if, if you could maybe text Al or email okay. him or something. Okay. okay. All right. All right. And Thank Frank. you so much. Uh, Frank, uh, Lisa, I have a question, Lisa. It's Frank Garcia. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, you know, we're all happy that the number of uh, cases are declining. Is it safe to say that it's declining because we're following safety procedures, whether it's masks, uh, washing our hands, and social distancing, or is it declining because COVID is going away on its own? Um, I think it's safer to say that uh, it's declining because we are putting, we have put so many safety practices in place. And our county, um, our state, we've done a really, really good job. I think we need to commend the citizens of Ottawa County for taking this seriously. Um, we've been successful. People are washing their hands, people are wearing masks, people are uh, abiding by the uh, non-gathering part of the executive orders and it's working. Um, and I think that we're all tired of living under the umbrella of COVID. Um, but if we can just stay vigilant a little bit longer, I think we're gonna be out of the woods. And we're already seeing that a lot of our businesses are fully reopened. Um, 
Some are partially reopened, but are doing quite well. Uh, we do stay in contact, especially with the businesses that we have regulatory authority over and uh, particular food establishments and they're, they're growing. So that's good news. Um, I can tell you too, because we do so much within the uh, regulatory work in the building and uh, construction industry, uh, we have not seen any decline in that. Things are going really well, but we just have to stay strong. So yes, the answer to your question is it's because everybody is doing a great job. Oh, and, and Marcia has the death data. We were able to get that. Lisa, Al Danaber here. Um, yeah, go ahead. I saw in the paper that um, I think it was West Olive Nursery got fined uh, $1,000, $2,000. There's a few other more in the state. Did that come from the local county or health department or did that come from the state that fine for those companies that didn't abide by that? Um, that fine did, was not issued by our department. And this is the first I've heard of, of it. So it must have come from the state. It was from my OSHA. My OSHA. Yeah, okay, okay, my OSHA. But it was to deal with the coronavirus that they were not following protocol on whatever okay. that is. So, yep. okay, just wondering. Thank you. Lisa, we have one more question. Lisa okay. Randy Meplink. Um, I, my question is, and this comes from, this, um, from parents at the schools, and um, my question is, when a, if a student and, and currently, a student being sent home by the school uh, for a cough or a suspected sickness, even with a negative, or you know, with a, uh, they do a temperature and they're um, and they're fine on the temperature. They're sent home from school. They have to be home for 24 hours, and then they have to also have a negative COVID test to come back to school. My concern is that if this is gonna cause a hardship to a parent, because now if it's a elementary student and the parent has to stay home uh, or find uh, care uh, things, and this could also bleed into the employment side of that, where now the employer hears that the parent has to stay home because a child was sent home from, via a school teacher sent home and they're waiting a negative COVID test result, then does, that worker have to stay. I mean, where does it, where do we, where does it stop? But my challenge, I guess, is, is there a way that we can help the schools and get test results faster? Um, I know that, you know, that it's 24 to 48 hours, but I've heard of faster test results or testing that could be done. Um, because if this is what we have to do, we need to find a way that we can make it that we don't create a hardship for the parent of the elementary student that, that can't take care of themselves. Um, and that's not an answer you're gonna have for me today, and I know that. I just, okay, because it's a very broad question. Um, you know, but I just, I guess, you know, in the, in the one instance where I was talked to about it, you know, the parent is questioning whether or not it was allergies or whether it was a cold, and then the a teacher was making that decision, uh, and do we, and, they don't want that responsibility in as much as we wouldn't want that responsibility because we would, as the parent, would want to be the responsible person to make that decision. So there's m multiple, multiple things that are going on here. I just, I just want to be sure that, and I know you are, but I want to be sure the department is looking at the broader question as to the effects downstream. You know, you have to think of if you throw a stone in, a, in, a, in a, the lake, there's a ripple, the stone disappears right away, but the ripples continue on. And what those ripples do cause are cause and effect to many other things. And uh, um, so it was more a comment, I guess, than a question. I really just not a question, Lisa, for you, other than that we need to be concerned about this with the schools, I think. And I know you are, but if there's a way that we can find a better solution than what's happening right now, that's what I guess is what I, I wanted to talk about. So. Thank you. Oh, yes, and, and I just want to say thank you for bringing that up to us. Um, this is an issue that we are very, very sensitive to. Um, we really see um, the impact of children not being in school. We believe that the best place for children is in school um, if they are you know, kept safe. 
and we believe they are. Um, we've got a lot of fantastic school personnel uh, from the leadership throughout all of the organizations um, who are working really hard to take care of our kids. Um, this is a, the, the issues that you raise are consistent across the nation. Um, we have been taking these up to our uh, state leadership and communicating with them and trying to identify uh, better ways to do testing, to do faster testing, to uh, be consistent in how we're uh, mitigating uh, the spread of disease, um, especially in our K-12 uh, population. Um, in fact, Marcia can speak to this much better than I can. She has been on, oh boy, a whole bunch of different committees to try to really work through and be thoughtful about how best to address the situation in the K-12 space and how best to address the concerns of parents, um, to address the concerns of parents who have children that have special needs. Um, there is multi-nuanced, um, but we are working really hard. And, um, and, I, and I believe we have a great partnership with our districts. So Marcia, do you wanna add anything to that? I think Lisa covered it very well. We're also looking at um, not putting an additional burden on our healthcare providers with um, parents needing to go to their doctor to get some kind of letter to bring back for, for every school kid. So we have talked to schools about not making that a requirement um, and taking a parent's word for it if they called their doctor or saw their doctor and their doctor has an alternative diagnosis and says, I think this is allergies, or I think this is the whatever X chronic condition your child has, um, so that we don't overburden the healthcare system as well. So there's a, like Lisa said, a lot of nuances with this. Anyone else? If not, Lisa, I just want to ask, um, how important is it um, for your department that um, we continue the emergency um, declaration in the county? Well, um, I feel it's very important. Um, and I feel that, um, unfortunately, um, there's some misunderstanding about the emergency order and Al can probably do a much better job of giving the <laughs> review of what it means than I, but um, I can tell you on a very practical level, um, it is, uh, has allowed our department to to the needs of the health needs and the health concerns of our community. Um, examples include um, when we had surges in cases, we received some, um, some funds from the state that allowed us to increase the level of staff that we have to do case and contact investigation. And um, Al and Marcy, our, our fiscal and human resources, and administrative staff along with public health came together and within a day we were able to figure out a really, really good and quick uh, and reasonable and uh, cost effective solution. Um, and we were able to put it together in a matter of days. Um, and and uh, it, it's, it's really important for us to be able to be nimble um, and responsive. Um, COVID, I think we all can agree that the situation changes almost by the minute. And therefore, um, what we need in order to respond is flexibility. And that's really for us what the, the executive order allows is for flexibility. And that flexibility is critically important for us to care for our community, uh, which is our main mission, is protecting health. Thank you, Lisa. Does anyone else have any other comments or questions? If not, thank you, Lisa. Commissioner and, uh, Bergman, we do have, um, Marsha's gonna explain the deaths. We did get that information. If we could just take one more minute. Yes. Okay. So of the 66 deaths, 7% of them were probable deaths, which equals five. And they all occurred in April and May. Um, and was, that was likely limited testing. So they were probably probable cases that were not able to get a test and died, so that would mean that they were a close contact, likely to someone in their household who was a positive. So um, it's not, we're not able to do post-mortems on them at this point, but we haven't had any since May. 
Thank you. I think that was answers the question, right, Joe? Yep. All right. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, next thing is approval of agenda. Can I get a motion, please? So move. Or, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask that uh, action item number seven be deleted from approval of the agenda, please. All right. Anybody have any concerns about that? Joe, I think you and your finance committee had talked about that previously. Right. As well. Yeah, we had, had voted on it, but we, um, John had said that it was under the threshold, so we really don't have to um, take action on it. All right. So just um, just so you know, we're removing item seven under um, B action items. Okay, is there, there's been a move, move moved and approved um, and seconded. Comments or questions? Justin, would you call the roll please? Yes, sir. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Meppelink? Yes. Mr. Holtfloor? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? <clears throat> yes. Motion passes. Next thing is consent, consent resolutions, Mr. Fenske. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to make a motion to approve consent resolutions one through three. Mr. Chair, can we remove number three uh, budget adjustments, please? Um, do we have a... In order to remove it, we have to have a second. Justin, do we have to have a second to move or it can I just... so. So you're amending the motion to yep. remove that okay. from consent, right? Is there a second to removing item three from the consent agenda? If not, it stays. Okay. Comments or questions on the resolution? Co consent resolutions? That. Justin, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Holtfloor? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? No. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Meppelink? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Next thing is from administration, Mr. Holtfloor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item number one, declaration of local state and emergency resolution. Just motion is to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the resolution to extend the state of emergency within Ottawa County due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Support. It's been moved and supported. Um, Al, would you uh, just um, reinforce what this, sure. what this motion does and doesn't do? Sure. I, yes, I'd be glad to. So, uh, first of all, the motion does not shut anybody down anywhere or impact business in any way. The governor's executive orders that are ongoing take precedence uh, over any of that type of situation. So, uh, we, this resides underneath that and we have not regulated the closure of anybody. Uh, the health department is required though to at times enforce the governor's executive orders. Uh, really the reason we do it is just administrative flexibility and you can see that from the administrative rules that have been done. Uh, there are times, you know, even though it looks great to the outside world, the COVID numbers are stable and in some cases decreasing, but the, the pressure on our health staff is immense because they still have to do all the contact tracing for all those cases that come up at Grand Valley. And so for me to add the staff that we added, 100% paid for with CARES dollars, temporary staff paid for with CARES dollars, could take as long as a month if I take it through normal process. The flexibility you've given us allows <laughs> us to do that in a day. And so it's those types of situations that you've seen come through in the administrative rules that we've done. And again, we're very transparent and accountable. We've sent those on to you uh, all the way through. I haven't had a commissioner yet say, so, wow, you blew that one or that wasn't a good idea. And I should note that I asked the uh, head of MAC, uh, Steve Curry, uh, you know, how many counties are doing this? And he did a survey of the state. Uh, there weren't a huge number of counties to start with that did 
uh, the, the declarations. Uh, and there's a few of those that did, that continued, and some have let them lapse. Uh, Kent County never did one, but they did a separate resolution of extra authority that's still in place for their county administrator and the county administration. Uh, and then some gave extra authority to the health officer, but that doesn't really, we've also used this, as you know, uh, to also help the uh, sheriff's office, you know, with some imminent things and also some things that just benefited citizens like waiving the uh, convenience fees and internet transactions and, and some of those things. So it, it's really been more about convenience, quite honestly. And if you, if you decided not to renew it, certainly we would continue on uh, and we would just, uh, it would take longer to respond to some of the things that we've had the benefit to respond to fairly nimbly. Doug, I don't know if you wanted to. to yeah, <clears throat> I'll try to be quick. I know that's difficult for me, but <laughs> if, if I would ask you to think of three buckets, bucket number one are Governor Whitmer's emergency orders. Sandy, Ruth, and Gail were all, the, the people publicly commenting, were all referring to her restrictions out of that bucket. This is bucket number two, which is our emer inter emergency order locally. The third bucket would be Lisa's public health orders like she issued with Grand Valley. We've done certain other work with respect to the migrant community. So if bucket one goes away and there's efforts to do that in the Supreme Court and by legislation, then our second bucket might present for you some more challenges because that emergency order power could be used. It is not being used and it's not proposed to be used to go outside of our internal purposes. But we're not there and we're not asking that you extend this uh, to do that. We're keeping a tight lid 60 days on these so that you have that opportunity before it's ever used to go external to try to resist, uh, affect and regulate other organizations. <laughs> we are using the local EO to get financing and as Al and Lisa have said, to be efficient and frankly, to promote opening. And by that, I mean, look at this building. We have used the local emergency order to put a mask um, order in effect for our building so that we can be open and people can come in here and work with the county offices. That is being done exclusively through the EO and administrative rules that Al's issuing to try to promote opening. Likewise, with Lisa's emergency powers. We're being very prudent in how we use that. We are doing those, ironically, to try to promote the openings that we've already achieved. We've done that with the migrant community where we have recognized locally that migrants, if they're quarantined, can still work. They can <laughs> work and pick fruit in, in discrete locations while they're in quarantine even if they're COVID affected and they feel like working and want to work, we can isolate them and promote them to continue to work, which is very important to get their cooperation in this pandemic. So we've used it actually to facilitate the harvesting of our fruit crops in the midst of some of the governor's more restrictive restrictions. The Grand Valley action that we took in part was designed to protect the court system, which is opening jury trials, because we don't get a handle on that surge. K through nine or K through 12 and the court systems are going to be threatened in their continued opening. We put provisions in there to allow uh, those students to work in essential services, but in nursing facilities and in the schools, they need to get additional permission of those entities to facilitate the safe working of those students with their higher uh, propensity for COVID, uh, even if it's asymptomatic, so that those nursing homes are protected so that a school district can say with a student teacher, no, you can't come in because right now because your teacher 
is in a higher risk classification and that might be might put your teacher at risk so um, this the uh, faculty at Grand Valley sent a letter to the governor asking that it basically Grand Valley be shut down and that there not be in class a, a, a attendance by stepping in the way we did and working with Grand Valley those students can continue to go to class right now and hopefully we'll get a handle on this surge and they don't have to suspend on campus physical classes for their students so it's um, confusing to the public that we have these three buckets. It's confusing to the public because sometimes they think that by, you know, doing these actions, we are inhibiting and restricting the opening. And I would say in bucket number two and three, which is where we operate, we are sensitive to trying to keep the momentum we've got going in our community towards opening. And all the actions we're taking are designed to promote the, and protect that opening as it's occurring. So, you know, it, it is complicated. I, you know, I understand why people are confused, but these are positive things we're doing to promote the continued uh, opening of our community despite this pandemic. And as Lisa said, hopefully we're just a couple months from a vaccine and we can get past this in, in total. Thank you, Doug, for giving us those three buckets. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Generally supportive of the uh, state of emergency, but I did think Ms. Benton uh, raised a, a good point when she talked about morale, because I think in that sense, that falls outside of those three buckets. And I don't know if you know other members of this board have had that in their communities where outer county residents feel like the state of emergency is hurting morale in just a general sense. So I, I know that, you know, in a technical sense, you know, Doug is 100% right, but I think Ms. Batten raised a good point in that beyond the technicalities of what we're doing here, is there an overarching, you know, effect on morale of Ottawa County residents? And I don't have the answer to that, and maybe some other members may have, you know, better feel for that. Anybody else? I haven't heard that. Um, I understand what you're talking about, but I would suspect that much of the morale has to do with the, the the bucket number one as opposed to bucket number two. That may easily be. I, I don't know if she was, you know, uh, but she seemed very focused that the morale was as a result of Ottawa County's action. I just want to make sure that we're not taking action that may affect, you know, poor morale in the business community or anything like that. So, yeah, I think your example of the three buckets gives a clarity to it. So, um, any other comments or questions? Just, just one maybe? quick quick one. Maybe maybe the solution I. I, Doug, thank you, by the way, because that, that really clarifies it to me. But, and maybe and what, a little bit what you talked about, uh, Doug, also is maybe we should take this emergency and, and shorten it to 30 days instead of 60 days to show that we are seeing positive results. So therefore, because of the positive results, we, we have the ability to extend it another 30 days again, but at least... That way, if things happen at the legislative level with, with things changing, which could be when the, we know that that act was 1936 or 35 or whatever, if they get enough signatures, that changes everything. And uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's the solution where we can still have our administrator, we need to have those necessary powers. I totally agree with that, okay? And, but maybe this is a way that we can kind of find a middle ground a little bit towards that. Tim. That doesn't mean, Al, that you're not able to rescind any policies you put in place within those 60 days, right? Right. right. So whether it's 30 or 60 or 120 days, you can always start uh, rescinding any of those uh, protocols, I would imagine. Is that possible or not? Oh, you mean the ones that have been done? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, the day it ends, I'll go away. And then, so if, if you voted no on this, well, then we decide what we need to bring back to you at a board meeting to make permanent during COVID or, or whatever, right? Well, I guess my, my question is that, because I think it extends until November 28th. Or to your, your second meeting in November. Yeah. Yes. So, so what I'm saying is that between now and November 20-whatever, 
if if we found out all of a sudden if COVID-19 is, is no longer an issue, that you can say, you know, we're no longer requiring masks at Fillmore Commons. Oh, right, right. We would roll some of that back. Correct. I see what you're saying now. I thought you were talking about board policy in general, but no. Anything that we've put out, we can also just take back. Okay. And we would do so if that were the case, exactly as you said. Okay. Roger. Yes. Um, Al, we would, as a board, would be able to resend the order at any time, correct? Yes. Yes, you can resend anything that I've done okay. at any time, correct. Okay. So I mean, we, you've done too. So yeah, you could we right. can, resend it. If at a month from meeting. now we decide that it's, we're done, we can resend the executive order. Right. Correct. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions? Matt? Call the roll, please, Justin. Yes, sir. Mr. Dannenberg. Yes. Mr. Bauman. Yes. Mr. Fenske. Yes. Mr. Mepelink. Yes. Mr. Terpstra. Yes. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Mr. DeYoung. Yes. Mr. Holtfloor. Yes. Mr. Zylstra. Yes. And Mr. Bergman. Yes. Motion passes. I am number two. Ottawa County Officers Compensation Commission Resolution. Suggest the motion to approve and hold or in part and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the resolution regarding the recommendations of the Ottawa County Officers Compensation Commission for 2021 and 2022. Sir, it's been moved and supported. Comments or questions? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a comment if I could, please. Yes. Uh, last night I sent the board an email. I tried to do this memo, but the formatting was messed up and I was having difficulty with it. So I did put it in the form of a memo. I just wanted to give a little history uh, for a couple of you. This is the first time you've had uh, this come before you for a vote. And it's always good to have a, a refresher, I think. Uh, but the main reason, this board was created in 2005 and it sat for the first time in 2006. <coughs> Compensation Commission is made up of Ottawa County citizens and HR uh, helps provide data. We contract with somebody that does comparable studies of uh, the commissioner positions and the elected officials and the board chair and the board vice chair. So there's eight separate determinations uh, that the OCC makes. They meet every other year uh, on per state law. They meet for three times over a two month period, which is typically, it doesn't have to be, but it's typically been February and March uh, because the group likes to get its work done and a decision made by the board of commissioners before the filing date happens, used to be May, I don't know if it's April now or, or when that is. Uh, so that anybody who's thinking about running for one of those offices in Ottawa County will have a pretty firm fix on what the wage would be, the salary would be, not benefits, that's not set by this group, just wage. And so uh, under Michigan law, the OCC makes a determination. Once they've made that, the Board of Commissioners has three separate courses of action that you could take. One is to accept the recommendations as they've been made, or not actually the determination, it's a determination, not a recommendation. The second course of action would be to deny all of them, to turn down that determination. The third possibility is to accept some and not others. So you could say, well, we're going to accept the determination made for the sheriff, but we're not gonna accept the determination made for another position. But what you can't do is alter those. So you, if one position was going to get a 2% increase, you couldn't say, well, we think that position deserves 1% or 3%. You either turn down what they gave you, accept what they gave you, or accept some of the offices that they did and not others of what they did. And so this is a rare year because I don't remember the last time it was aligned where we had negotiations with all seven unions. Uh, we have the OCC uh, and we have the, uh, the wage and classification study, which we do every five years. So literally this will be a year when every single employee and officer under the Ottawa County umbrella uh, has their wages analyzed in, comp in comparable to comps uh, and so that we make sure we're paying everybody as equi equitably as we can while maintaining internal equity for the non-elected positions in the organization. 
So obviously I'm giving you the administrative pitch for why you should approve it. I mean, and I understand that you have political considerations. We heard some of those during public comment this morning. Obviously, I think they were referring to bucket one because you are not shutting any businesses down. So it isn't quite like you're shutting businesses down and then voting yourselves a pay raise. But if we're committed to make, making sure that all employees and officials in Ottawa County are paid equitably according to the comps, then if you don't accept it, we'll just have to do a bigger amount in four years just to keep up with your peers in comparable counties. And to me, that's not a good business solution, but it may be the best political solution. I mean, I can't answer that part of it because that's not what I do here. Uh, but I just wanted you and people out who are listening to the meeting and people who will view it later to know that there is a, at least a solid administrative logic for why you would approve these. That's it. Comments or questions? Uh, Justin, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Holtfloor? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. <clears throat> From Finance and Administration, Mr. Bauman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In regards to the agreement for property assessment administration services with Belinden Township, I make a motion to approve the agreement for property assessment administration services between Ottawa County and Blendon Township. Support. And moved and supported. Comments or questions? So, Michael, this is um, the third, third or fourth one that we're doing. This is our fourth unit. Uh, we start with a two-year contract um, just to see that we have the prices right and it, it's caught balanced with the cost. <laughs> this is our first three-year contract with Blendon Township. There was a, a slight increase that was needed and when the board passed us, they were very complimentary of the department's local assessing division and how well they did. So. And would you um, agree that most of the uh, units that that use the, uh, the county for their assessment, that it saves them um, a number of dollars? It saves them some money, yes. It's also uh, professionally done and uh, not, we have good assessors here. Yes. But yes. when Blinden was looking for an assessor, uh, they wanted part-time first, they couldn't find one. They went up to 70 some thousand, still couldn't find one and they came to us. So we weren't their first choice. They wanted their own assessor, but they couldn't find one. Now that they've had us for two years, they say it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah. We're not in the business of looking for units. If they have an assessor, keep it, you're doing fine. We're just an option that's available right. if it comes to that. Right, good, good. Any questions for Michael? Not just that's one right. small comment, if I could. Okay, Before sure. coming to your board next time, will be a, a designated assessor contract by the new assessment reform, we have to have a default designated assessor. If they fail their, uh, their state review twice, then it goes to designated assessor. Here in Ottawa County, we have great assessors. Even if one of them didn't happen to, uh, uh, got, didn't make it, they'd hire somebody else and it'd be fine, but we still have it in place. I've sent it out to all the local units. I've got, Jamestown's already approved it. Four more have told me it's coming to October. Uh, well, we need to have you as a board approve it and uh, a majority of the local units. And to come up with that, I took the, uh, the contract that we usually have, blended it with this long list the state says you have to have in it and put that together. So that'll be coming next time as well. Okay, good. Thank you. Justin, would you call the roll please? Yes, sir. Mr. Fenske. Yes. Mr. Zylstra. Yes. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Mr. Holtfloor. Yes. Mr. Bauman. Yes. Mr. DeYoung. Yes. Mr. Meplink. Yes. Mr. Danenberg. Yes. Mr. Terpstra. Yes. And Mr. Berkman. Yes. Motion passes. In regards to the 2021 budget resolution, I make a motion to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the fiscal year 2021 General Appropriations Act. Or I move to support it. Comments or questions? Justin, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Zylstra. Uh, yes. 
Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Holtvloer? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Regarding the resolution uh, for the distribution of convention facility tax revenues to counties, I make a motion to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the resolution regarding the distribution of convention facility tax revenues to counties <coughs> under public acts 106, 107 of 1985. Support. Unmoved and supported. Comments or questions? <coughs> Justin, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Holtvloer? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Regarding the Harbor Humane Society Service Agreement, I make a motion to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the renewal of the Harbor Humane Society Service Agreement. Court. Mr. Chair. Supported? Comments or questions? Yes. yes. I just want to say thanks to uh, John for kind of helping me out with this. And you know, it was a bit of a concern maybe in 2012-ish with the Humane Society. And it's really good to see that, you know, we're renewing this contract with a lot of confidence. So. Any other comments? If not, Justin, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Holtfloor? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Regarding the towing and impound service contract, I make a motion to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the proposals from Dick's Towing, Tim's Towing, Central Towing, and Hudsonville Towing to provide standardized pricing for towing and impound services. Support. Support. Moved support it. Comments or questions? Mr. Chair, I think yes. Under Sheriff Weiss would like to say a few words on this one. All right. Good afternoon, board chair and vice chair. Um, this has been um, a project we've been working on um, for a while now. And the reason for it is we've never had a contract in place uh, for towing. And we were looking to standardize pricing through the county for our county vehicles um, all across the board. So not just our sheriff's vehicles, but also when we impound or do an abandoned vehicle um, on the road. So what this does is it standardized the pricing in the four quadrants. And we went by four quadrants because of the fact that we wanted to make sure that they had um, a towing company in each one because the other issue that we deal with sometimes is uh, how long it takes the, to get to the patrol uh, vehicle if they're out on the road, if it's an impound or an abandoned. Um, so we looked at <clears throat> under 30 minutes for um, a response time and put some of those things in place as well. Uh, there's also a lot of legal uh, uh, obligations that uh, record services have to uh, go by uh, as well as the sheriff's office with when we impound or we have an abandoned vehicle. And we wanted to make sure that was uh, memorialized in a contract, which uh, Doug Van Essen helped us with. So we ended up with uh, Dick's Towing, Central Towing, Tim's Towing, and Hudsonville Towing. Uh, which we work with uh, all of them, except we have not worked with Central in the past, but we've worked with all of them already. Uh, so again, this is just standardize the pricing and in some of the um, making sure we're uh, abiding by all the laws. Good. I'm glad to see that you did this. Yeah. Any comments? If you um, tow a vehicle off a road mm -hmm. um, and they have to lock it up, am I correct? Yes. They bring it to their lot, lock yes. it up. What does it usually cost to get the vehicle back out? It, it, well, it depends because it depends on how long they're there. It depends on why it's there. Um, that's the, in the contract. Um, it goes into evidentiary because that's also something we would use if we have a homicide, let's say, and we have to take the car into custody. We have to make sure it's a locked facility. So in the contract, we want a locked facility, what that looks like if we can gain entry, when they can let people come to access. If we impound it, um, they may need to get some personal effects if we have a fatal crash. So there's a lot of things that are incorporated in this, and some of it has to do with the uh, pit, the, how much you pay for storage, but it just depends, depends okay. on how long it's there. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, Val, real quick. Um, if folks have an abandoned vehicle and they come and their vehicle's no longer there, 
what do they usually call? Do they usually call you or they call? You know, usually they'll call dispatch. Yeah. Okay. So then dispatch will dispatch has call us. all that information. Yes. And then they give us their name and their uh, registration plate and we're able to pit. We can pull that up in our lean okay. uh, access and we start so we, chasing we'll, after their car. No, okay. we'll, we'll see where it went and then we let them know. Okay, great. Thank you. So we really looked at too is um, making sure that the public has a place available for them to go to get their car, which is important too. And after hours, you know, there's a lot of things that went into this uh, project, but we're glad that we are finally there, have something in place. Are those 24 hour lots or not necessarily? No, no, but there's certain times when we need to access um, and the people have an access point of, a, of somewhere to call to find out how to get their car. So Val, if I have an accident and I end up in the hospital, and, and my car gets towed, it gets towed by one of these companies, correct? Yes, yeah. well, it, it depends because we have a towing contract. Somebody and like so a that's a little bit different. So what happens is, is uh, the Auto County Dispatch has a, also is working on a contract that Doug's working on, and that would be something where it would be towed and we have a no preference list and that's your dispatch. We don't oversee that. So our guys will call and say, I need a no preference uh, wrecker, and then that wrecker comes and it's taken to a tow yard. Okay. And that could be any tow yard. Okay, all right. Okay, any other comments? Thanks, Val. You're welcome. Thank you. Justin, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Myers. He's not here. Absentee ballot. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Holfloor. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Garcia. Yes. Mr. Dannenberg. Yes. Mr. DeYoung. Yes. Mr. Zylstra. Yes. Mr. Terp Terpstra. Yes. Mr. Meplink. Yes. Mr. Bauman. Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Regarding the Jenison Mill grant agreement, I make a motion to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the grant agreement for $300,000 from the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund for funding assistance to construct the Jenison Mills segment of the Itama Explorers Trail in Georgetown Township. Moved and seconded. Comments or questions? Justin, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Holfloor? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. From talent and recruitment, Mr. Garcia? Yes. M Mr. Chairman, if I could have John Shea explain why we are re- activating the solid waste planning committee before we put the names up. Okay. A uh, couple months ago, Consumers Energy contacted the county uh, and they're looking to uh, expand their uh, dry ash landfill at their J.H. Campbell plant in Port Sheldon. And in order to do that, they need to apply for a permit with Eagle and in order, as part of that permit application, they need a letter of consistency from the county solid waste planning committee. Uh, the committee, I believe last met in 2014, 2015. Uh, so we really had to repopulate the committee at this point. It's a 14 member uh, committee and it's composed with two year terms and it's composed of, of those 14, four members represent the solid waste management industry. Two members represent the environmental interest groups. One member represents county government. One represents city government. One represents township government. Uh, one represents the regional solid waste planning agency. One represents the industrial waste generators and three represent the general public. Uh, so uh, excluding uh, the county uh, commissioner appointment, there are 13 seats. Uh, there are 12 applicants here. Uh, we did have 13 applicants, uh, but one had to withdraw. So there are 12, 12 vying for 13 seats, uh, plus there needs to be an appointment among one of the county commissioners to this planning committee as well. Okay, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. So since there are 12 uh, candidates for 13 slots, you know, I'm just gonna put the name them all and then we can just do a yay nay vote uh, if that's possible. So for the uh, general public vacancies, uh, we're nominating William Salberg, Ken Freestone, Becky Huttenenga. Uh, for the government vacancy, we have Thomas Unk. 
for the environmental interest group. We have Kelly Coward, 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 Coward uh, and Benjamin Jordan. For the regional and county solid waste planning, uh, planning agency, we have Stuart Whitney. For the city government uh, the vacancy, we have Aaron Thylenwood. And for the uh, solid waste industry, we have Carrie Bliss, Russ Borsma, Justin Opermeyer, and Matt Rosser. Support. It's been moved and supported. Comments or questions? Justin, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Mepelink? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Holtvor? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. And we have one more uh, vacancy, Mr. Chairman, that, that the board needs to nominate a current board member to sit on that. Yes. I'd like to nominate Frank Garcia for that position. Support. Art. You sure no one else wants that? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody object to Frank? No, I wouldn't mind being on it either. I got two of them in my district. One's uh, the Holland uh, Board of Public Work has one on 56th Street and so does Waste Management has the Autumn Hills one, both in my district. John, can we open up another position because there's, we couldn't, have two commissioners. Fine. Frank, I'm fine. No, I mean we're we're not fully st we're not fully. You yeah. Sorry. No, I have one commissioner on. Yeah. Correct. That's right. No, the, this state law says you can only have one county commissioner on that. Okay, committee. he couldn't apply as the general public like I am on the housing commission. No. Okay. 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 So we have a motion to um, elect Frank Garcia. Any okay? Any other comments or questions? Justin, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Holtvor? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Zaster? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Bergman? Yes. 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 The administrator is next. Uh, yeah, very short today. Uh, obviously, getting something as massive as a $200 million budget done takes a, a large team to do, but just wanted to recognize Karen this morning and thank her uh, for persevering through a year where she lost her budget person to uh, East Grand Rapids as their new finance director and uh, carried it across the finish line. So uh, we certainly uh, appreciate her contributions and hard work in getting this done. And I'll keep it short. That's all I have today. All right. Next thing is general information, comments, or meetings attended. Yes. Um, Farms Are the Tapas is still taking place this Thursday, Terra Square in Hudsonville. The weather is cooperating. Starts at 6 p.m. And uh, right now we have uh, 40 individuals that have already signed up. It's going to be uh, on high top tables. So um, social distancing and safety is uh, uh, going to be much easier that way being outdoors and so uh, please consider attendance if you can't make it you can always bid on the uh, oh absolutely on yep. items it's uh, online right now yeah because i think one of the commissioners bid against me on something <laughs> not this right. time it was not me yet this time <laughs> yeah this is the word <laughs> you probably want the the, the boat trip right no with, the uh, cliff the grilling ah. <laughs> Anyone else? Roger. Yes. Uh, regarding the, the pharma uh, or the tapas, um, Stephanie has an extra ticket. I had bought a ticket and I'm not going to be able to attend. So if anyone likes, would like to go, there's a free ticket on Stephanie's desk. So. Mr. Chair. Yes. Yeah, I'd also like to thank Karen for all her help uh, answering my questions. I know that you're short staffed, um, but I really appreciate that as well. And I just want to comment um, on all the uh, staff that are here today and appreciate the fact that you show interest in, in uh, what this commission is doing and, and uh, appreciate the work that you guys are all doing for the benefit of the citizens of Ottawa County. Thank you for being here. And uh, with that, um, we'll take public comment. Does anyone want to address council at the commission at this time? 
after 12 years of being on a city council, I have a hard time <laughs> remembering that this isn't a council, this is a commission. So is there anybody on Zoom that wants to address this commission? We do not have anyone on Zoom, Mr. Chair. All right. Oh, we do have one comment. I'm sorry, we have one okay. individual. Right. And this is Ruth Van Hoven. And again, Ruth, sorry for the repetition, but your uh, name and address for the record. Ruth, can you unmute yourself? I'm no. talking to me, eh? <laughs> Ruth Van Hoven, um, 8276 Hay Street, Coopersville, Michigan. And I just um, am really, my eyes have been opened up a lot today. And uh, I'm really fueled to be part of the solution in our county. And I'm not sure where I fit, but I'm sure I'll be meeting each of you. And I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thanks for... Uh, coming on and uh, staying with us today. Anyone else? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. To adjourn. So moved. Moved. moved and seconded. Comments or questions? All in favor say aye. 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 We're opposed or we're, we're, we're adjourned. <laughs> are, we, are we off, Justin?